You're in some sense an engineer. My dream, my vision is to engineer life, right? Is to engineer life from the non-living. So yes, you can definitely, you can definitely call me an engineer. If you wanted to create your own new and synthetic form of life from scratch, how do you do it? That's what this conversation is about. I speak to Kirsten Gertfrisch, who's engineering synthetic cells from scratch, piece by piece, at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Germany. Kirsten explains how she builds cell membranes, cytoskeletons, internal power sources, and mechanisms for cell division and replication, all from non-living materials. We also discuss the origins of life and the ethics of bringing an entirely new branch of life into existence. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast, supported by the Andrew Von Brown Foundation. If you enjoy these conversations and want to help support me, you can do so by liking, subscribing, and sharing. And now, here's Kirsten Gopfrich. I hope you enjoy. Escape Sapiens. Let's start with a big question. What is life? You start with the hardest question on the planet. Huh? <laughs> yeah, life... Life is really hard to define, right? There are so many definitions of life out there um, from a list of features like hallmarks of life, such as self-replication, evolution, um, metabolism, my, uh, response to stimuli, right? This is the typical list of features that, that biologists like and that they... Uh, that they that they use somehow we have an intuitive feeling feeling of what is alive and not right like the kind of this thing of i know when i look at it right um but a common definition is is yet to be found nasa says something like a, like a safe self-sustained chemical system capable of of darwinian evolution and this is somehow i would say the working definition in my scientific field so this is pretty a pretty useful definition because it gives us a clear task of what mm. what sh what we should be doing what we should be looking out for but you approach the question more as an engineer right so it's so it's definitely function for you that's important it's definitely function even though I believe that life is more than the sum of its parts. So there are somehow emergent properties to life. So just having a list of hallmarks and trying to engineer a list of hallmarks, I don't think is going to lead to a fully, to a living system in the end. So we can't just piece together pieces of a puzzle and expect that all of a sudden they come alive, right? I don't think if you take a cell, you smash it into pieces, put, take all the pieces, put them together, um, and do this, you know, you're not going to end up with something that's alive. Um, so I believe we need a functional definition. But working towards this, this function means that we need to do it in an integrative way. So, you know, we need to use parts that are inherently capable of evolution, for instance. I see. So, so you would imagining if imagine if we had some AI controlled mm -hmm. robot that could self replicate, but couldn't evolve. You mm -hmm. wouldn't class that as life. No, and I guess for two reasons, actually, because um, first of all, I define life as a self-sustained chemical system, meaning mm -hmm. uh, at least in my field, or, or at least for me, there has to be a physical manifest. So just life in the computer, this kind of artificial life, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe an, a super interesting field as well. But we are actually trying to build something, something physical, a physical ma manifest, a chemical system, mm -hmm. right? So um, in that sense... To, to, I, I say no twice. So first of all, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a life because it's uh, because it's just just in the computer. Secondly, um, evolution is is an inherent part of life in 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 my opinion. Um, and yeah, for this reason, this is what we should be working towards. It's the most interesting thing. It was it's what gives rise to the to the versatility of life that we see all around us. Right. So that makes it so exciting. So do you think then on Earth, now that you've spent some time trying to build life, do you think life on Earth was inevitable? Or do you think it's something really special that we're very lucky to have? Well, I guess whenever we thought that something is really special, we were proven wrong. <laughs> so just based on that experience and or on that historical experience, I guess that um, that most probably, yeah, most probably um, somehow if the conditions are right, we couldn't can expect life to emerge. And this is also part of the reason of why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not trying to engineer life exactly in the way it how it emerged on planet Earth. I'm just 
trying to engineer a life 2.0, you know, um, which which may be a bit different from, from life as we know it, but it brings us closer to the inherent question, like what if we replay the history of evolution? Would we end up with the same thing? Is it possible to, to you know, get around some of the fundamental features uh, that we, that, that living systems on earth show, but build life uh, in, a, in a different way? You know, how different could life be? I think these are really fascinating questions that, that we can, you know, we can include in our approach by just, you know, not constraining ourselves to this narrow-minded idea of uh, and trying to engineer life how it is. So, so do you think then, so, so following that, do you think that carbon-based life or uh, organisms which rely on the DNA structures that we have, do you think somehow they're around because that's the only option or was this something I imagine it has to be a guess, but do you think this is something that was competed for sort of in a evolutionary way? I mean, so I think the fact that that life is carbon based, that life happens in water and so on, these are um, these are one very, very fundamental features. And I, I, I wouldn't even go I wouldn't even go that deep. But I mean, the fact alone, like chemically speaking, all life on earth is extremely similar, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, what I mean by this is, for instance, if we look at the central dogma of molecular biology, it's called the central dogma because all life functions according to it, right? Mm -hmm. Means that DNA gets translated, uh, gets, uh, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, right? And the protein is the functional part, the DNA is the information storage, right? So the chemical nature of the molecular hardware is, is, very well defined. So um, the kind of questions that we are asking is, you know, is the central dogma inevitable? Mm. Or could we imagine a form of life where, for instance, information and function like uh, happens in the same molecule where, for instance, we, we override the central dogma by building our own molecular hardware say from nucleic acids, from DNA or RNA, because this whole transcription and translation machinery, the central dogma of molecular biology is it's just super complex, right? And yeah, certainly a result of evolution, but somehow we must have started with something simpler. Right? Mm. Do you think the environment for the start of life still exists on Earth? Or do you think it's, uh, you know, as far as I understand, we all share a common ancestor. If you look at every organism on Earth, we all share a common ancestor as far as I understand. Is, is that because any new life is outcompeted by the life that currently exists or do the conditions just not exist anymore for life to start again? So I don't want to comment on the, on the conditions under which life started on early Earth because A, I'm not an expert. B, I think it's quite difficult to know. Mm -hmm. um, however, I believe that in principle under the conditions that we have on Earth, life may be able to start. I don't see a physical reason why it shouldn't. But since there is already so much life that's extremely successful and occupies a lot of the niches, any form of new life mm. isn't very robust yet, right? So it will be outcompeted very, very quickly by the existing very sophisticated forms of life that we have around us. So this is also why in the laboratory, I think it's extremely exciting that we can create conditions where there is no other life around mm. <laughs> and um, we can we can start from scratch. We don't have to we don't have to constrain ourselves to conditions that may or may not have existed on early Earth. We can just give ourselves the freedom to be creative, to make our own building blocks, to build life as we don't know it. Right. Or to build to build, you know, something which fulfills a basic definition of life. So that means in your laboratory, you don't go out of your way to try to set up the environment that you suspect uh, was initially there when life formed. Uh, we are not. Other people are, of course, very successfully doing it. And I think it's a very active, the origins of life field is a very active and, and also exciting field of research. And for sure, there's some overlap. But what we are doing is we are not trying to understand what conditions existed on early Earth um, and trying to replicate those. Those we are really thinking abstract and maybe is, is the physicist speaking here in me because I'm a physicist by training and, you know, as, as physicists, we really like models, right? And I would like to build an abstract model of a living cell, which with, without constraints, without mm -hmm. constraints. Like whether what I'm building 
is exactly how it happened on early Earth or whether it's just, you know, something that we, you know, come up with as, as a solution towards self-replication plus evolution, um, you know, I think it's exciting to, to just give ourselves the freedom because the, comple the problem is complex enough, right? So I don't mm -hmm. really see... Um, yeah, so... so, so um, Yeah, I think the motivations are just different, right? If you, I, it's it's a, 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 an exciting question to ask yourself: How did life emerge on on early Earth, right? Mm. But it's also an exciting question to ask: How could life emerge? Mm. What? Yeah, and then it's a, a third question: Is you know trying to understand life as it is and that's what that's what uh, also part people in the field are doing especially in the field of bottom-up synthetic biology where um, people are trying to reconstitute minimal systems mm -hmm. they that exhibit at least a feature of life one of the one of the hallmarks for instance right um, and this of course gives us insights into into life as it is um, so I think there are just different motivations to pursue similar kinds of research. I see. So then let's talk about synthetic biology, right? This is really your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. So just to sort of set the context, what is it and what makes it biology? <laughs> so you sort of touched on this already, but... Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so synthetic biology, I should say, um, I, sh I should say uh, we have to first of all divide into into different types of branches, like, right? In synthetic biology, the classical approach is is top down synthetic biology, which is about which is about engineering uh, genomes for of existing organisms. So uh, very very famously, so uh, the minimal cell that comes from the Craig Venter laboratory, where you actually take the genome of an existing organism, you try and identify the genes that are essential for that organism to proliferate, to live. And then you take, you synthesize the gene in the laboratory and then you put it into an existing bacterium, into a cas casis, so to say, into an exposure and you boot the genome inside that, uh, inside that organism. And uh, so, so that's super exciting um, and has also, has also given rise to, to minimal cells, um, to synthetic cells. Um, What we do is we really, the, in, in the bottom-up field, so to say, so the counterpart to top-down synthetic biology, is we really want to engineer life from the non-living. Meaning we literally start with molecular building blocks, kind of a, kind of a toolbox of our choice. Um, and we try and put these parts together to make, to, to, to make life from scratch, so to say. Um, and... Again, there you could you could define different sub branches, right? So you could take exactly the molecules that that cells use today, proteins, evolved proteins, and so on. Um, you could take uh, you could engineer your own parts, what we do with DNA, RNA, nanotechnology, or you could even go as far as to uh, to the systems chemistry field, where where um, scientists are developing entirely new chemistries, which uh, which have which have uh, properties that uh, that make up living systems right so uh, there is a whole scale from entirely natural to entirely synthetic mm. in this bottom-up field mm. um, but so you really focus on function it, it, for you it doesn't matter whether you're using completely let's say alien materials uh, or whether you're using dna it, as long as you can re regenerate sort of the function that you're interested in you, you're in some sense an engineer my my dream my dream my vision is to engineer life, right? Is to engineer life from the non-living. So yes, you can definitely, you can definitely um, call me an engineer. Yes, um, and um, actually, actually, if we look at the, if we look at engineering, right? My my husband is an engineer, uh, an engineer at Bosch. Um, we can learn a lot from from the type of from uh, the engineering problem is entirely different. Of course, it's much more it's much more complex. Um, in the sense that there are so many components that defining life is hard and so on but we can learn from 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 engineering definitely in terms of the in terms of the approaches so to give you one example um really from from 
engineering in big companies like Bosch, you know, they, they debate whether they should do modular engineering, meaning mm -hmm. taking pieces and trying to piece them then together, or systems engineering, which is more, you know, um, thinking about function first and mm -hmm. splitting up function in this uh, and uh, into into subdomains and then kind of going up, going up um, towards uh towards the validation of those going up towards the integration of those and um yeah so so we can definitely and and what i'm saying is that i think the systems engineering approach is is uh, definitely helping us towards towards engineering engineering life um a book that has inspired me a lot on this on this engineering approach or, or engineering life aspect is actually this one it's called the toaster project um which was a project by an artist who was actually trying to build a toaster from scratch <laughs> you know and if you if you want to build a cell from scratch i think it's quite a useful um a useful uh, well thing to read because he is facing some of some of the same problems that we are facing so first he started out by deconstructing the toaster you know mm -hmm. looking at the looking at the different pieces and this is what we do right we can uh, deconstruct a cell look which pieces are there identify the important ones and so on and then try and piece them back together mm -hmm. but then he also says things like you know what does it mean to build from scratch right it's never you're never truly building things from scratch you're always building up on something that is there right so but, but i've heard about this story right so he actually mined the materials himself yes. and he he made the plastic casing he so his goal was to start from complete scratch and he picked the simplest thing he could imagine everyone has a toaster in their house but then i think from memory when he opened it up he saw circuit boards and all sorts of <laughs> complicated and then, things and then he took apart even the circuit boards and and then little transistors and so on and capacitors and looked at the different materials that go into those right so there's mm -hmm. always whenever you have a part you have a sub part and this mm -hmm. is also what we what we are seeing right whenever yeah you have a cell then inside the cell there's a nucleus inside the nucleus there's again many many different parts there is the dna but then the dna is made of nucleotides and so on and so forth so you can go deeper and deeper down um so um yeah it's just an extremely complex engineering problem even engineering a toaster right eventually he con concludes it needs it needs a, a whole society or, or mankind to build a, a toaster because it seems you know it seems we are we are building so much up on knowledge that has been generated by others um but to preface your own work was he successful Do you define this as success? <laughs> <laughs> so for those who are just listening, uh, Kirsten's holding up a book with a mangled looking toaster on the cover. <laughs> I, I think it's successful. I mean, as, as so, long as it can toast a piece of bread. I think it can. It doesn't have an automatic switch off, um, though. Um, it has a price tag on it, which I think was one over $1,000. <laughs> so, you know, um, trying to... I think whenever you're trying to reverse engineer something, when you're trying to re-engineer something, you should also think about um, in being innovative, right? Yeah. And in a, in a way he did, right? You don't just want to reinvent the wheel. Mm. You actually want to come up with, um, you know, like, for instance, if you want to engineer a toaster, you could be thinking about how do I make it more energy efficient? How can a toaster make better bread, right? Mm. And in a similar way, we can think about engineering a cell, right? How do we actually make it do something that a cell cannot do yet. Right? And this, mm -hmm. this leads us towards the applications also of synthetic biology uh, or, or also bottom-up synthetic mm -hmm. biology. Um, Before jumping into that, let's imagine you're successful and you uh, boot life 2.0. There's a new form of life that you've invented. What would you call it? <laughs> well... It would not be a the, dream, the you know. Archaea, <laughs> not the bacteria, your branch. That 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 would be a dream to be allowed to name life 2.2.0. So if you say. boot it, you're um, allowed. Well, I guess I guess um, I guess we try and talk about about synthetic life, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's a good name. I I like to I like to often say I'm trying to build a model of a cell. So maybe like. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, because maybe again, it's the physicist in me speaking that that uh, we want to create this to start with mm. the simplest possible um, form of life, because I fundamentally believe that complexity can come in through evolution. So we really want to go as simple as possible to build a model. Models have been so successful in the world of physics, right? They have been describing the world around us for, for, for you know, centuries. So I think this way of thinking in abstract models is, is quite powerful. So I quite like the term model cell or, or you know, as in cell, not the biolog not in the biological sense necessarily. When I say cell, people immediately think, you know, bacterium, eukaryote, whatever. No, this is not what I mean. I mean cell as in a minimal, a minimal living entity. So this is my definition of a cell, a minimal living entity. So I want to build a model of a uh, a minimal model of a living entity, right? Um, okay, so then let's let's talk about that. What are the what are the minimal engineering steps you need to take to get what you want? What are the what are the and also where do you start? So what are the minimal steps and where do you start? Yeah, so I guess this brings us back to the definition, right? Self-replication, a minimal system capable of self-replication and open-ended evolution. So where would I start? I would start by thinking about the building blocks, the building blocks that I need. Um, so basically, um, I guess an information carrier, an information carrier that makes a phenotype up on which evolu phenotype meaning um, a, physical, a physical function upon which evolution can act. So, and this now is the first choice to make, right? What kind of toolbox, what kind of building blocks do you want to use? Um, so, of course, you could say the, the building blocks of, of, of cells, right? So you could say proteins, for instance, right? They make the functions in cells and they also carry information, the, nuclei, the, the amino acids in their amino acid sequence. But proteins have the fundamental problem that they cannot make more of themselves, mm. Right? So if you want to build a self-replicating system based on proteins, it won't work. Mm -hmm. You actually need the entire machinery that makes proteins. So DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, and this whole machinery. And actually in, in 2007, Foster and Church were, um, were um, conceptualizing or thinking about how many genes you would need in order to to get there, right? And they, they said, well, at least you need, uh, I think, 38 RNAs and 113 different proteins uh, that, you, that you genetically encode. So that's already above 150 genes, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, uh, so that's, that's quite complex for me as a physicist. So I think, can we get around this central dogma? Can we get around, can we think of a simpler way? Can we use molecules which can inherently make more of themselves? Mm -hmm. And then you come to DNA and RNA. Because DNA and RNA have the inherent capacity to make more of themselves. And this is why in my group we started out engineering components with DNA origami, DNA nanotechnology. But now in order to get catalysis in, in order to get out of equilibrium dynamics in, actually RNA is the better molecule. So we're now more and more transitioning towards RNA origami in, inside our synthetic cells. Um, so this is the molecular hardware because mm -hmm. RNA and DNA can both store information as well as execute function if we build mm -hmm. function with R. Um, but then we need other tools for assembly, right? And for this, in my group, we uh, we use microfluidics, um, we use uh, 3D laser printing. So we've explored different tools. So always, whenever something comes up in the hor on the horizon, you know, new kind of technologies, we think about are they useful for us? You know, what can we do with them in our context of, of synthetic biology? So, you know, um, I think the holy grail is to not, to not become narrow-minded and to actually keep exploring new tools and new materials as they come up. Because, yeah, that's... But, so if, if you were to write down a list of the things you need, so uh, for instance, we need, a, of course, RNA, something like this, something to hold information, uh, do you do you want to have a you know an enclosed container yeah. to hold? What 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 are the what is that what does that laundry list mm -hmm. look like? Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, in, in some sense, what are you ticking off? What what are we ticking off? Well, container. This is an this is this is an interesting one, right? Because if you want to have a cell, we we always always think about a bubble, a bubble that contains lots of things, right? Um, so, some kind of enclosure. Yes. If you if you want to talk about a living entity, you somehow need to distinguish self from the environment, right? Mm -hmm. um, you need to compete with your other kind of uh, uh, with other cells for uh, for resources, for instance, right? So yes, I would agree. You need some kind of a compartment. You could be more general and maybe more theoretical <laughs> and, and and say, okay, some form of spatial patterning is enough, right? Do you really need this round enclosure or so? Maybe not, but at least spatial patterning. Um, what what we do is we actually use lipids. So to, mm -hmm. to tick off your box, we actually use lipids um, um, as compartments, so liposomes, so called uh, so called uh, lipid vesicles mm -hmm. that uh, we use as enclosures for our materials. Simply because uh, there are straightforward ways to make them. Um, also, because when we build life based on based on lipid vesicles, we can di directly interface it with life as we, as we is as it is. Plus, the things that we build are actually sometimes as byproducts are interesting for biologists. So we can kind of have a you know, even though we follow a blue skies completely blue skies vision, we can kind of have tools and materials and and questions and uh, and technologies that we can pass on pass on to our colleagues in biology and in medicine. And this is. I love the Heidelberg environment. There's a lot of them um, where, um, where you know, the kind of components that we build can actually be useful. And this for us or for me is one of the main reasons to, you know, not go completely crazy and uh, uh, but but actually stick to to some of the molecular building blocks that that life is using, but actually engineering them in a completely different way. Um, mm. So we use liposomes, we use DNA origami and RNA origami um, as, as, as molecular hardware, so to say. Um, so, so, yeah, the vision is really that, that our version of a synthetic cell, so to say, uh, will be based on a lipid vesicle and operate based on our own molecular hardware that we engineer with DNA and RNA nanotechnology. So this is your components. <laughs> but I'm surprised you, you said it was somehow simple to build. So just for people who aren't familiar, you have some sort of um, water container that's surrounded by a lipid layer, a, a membrane, mm -hmm. and then that can exist in a, an aqueous environment, yeah. some, some water. It's, how, how do you build that? Because in, in my mind, so say I was going to build this sort of thing in oil. Oil and water don't mix, so it's very easy to get little bubbles of water mm -hmm. in oil. But then how do you get it to be cell sized and how do you get – that to exist in, in water, is it really simple? And this is a long question. Is it really that simple? And does it sort of give you, does it make you, does it help you understand whether nature could have done this e mm -hmm. easily? Mm -hmm. right? So liposomes actually we can form by more or less self-assembly processes, at least out of, equilibri out of equilibrium self-assembly. So what you can do is you can, for instance, and there's many ways of doing this, there's microfluidic methods to make uh, liposomes. There is, um, there is, you could spread lipids on a surface and apply an electric field to it. And then uh, liposomes, lipid vesicles will just bubble up. So in a way, it's a, it's kind of a self, uh, it's kind of a, yeah, it's kind of an assembly process that you can, that you can have running in the lab but so you can you can readily understand how it happened in nature then is it simple enough that you could imagine this, vesicles is it to form in nature vesicles of that size yeah yeah because if you have if you have for instance and again i'm not in the origins of life field right but if you say if you have lipids that are deposited on mm -hmm. some kind of surface say a surface of a rock and then you have wet dry cycles for instance or or um yeah um also uh, you you can the, these uh, these lipids can come off the rock and basically form form little lipid bubbles right this is definitely imaginable i see and so the second thing you mentioned is DNA uh, engineering, do you call it, or DNA DNA origami. nanotechnology, yeah. DNA origami, yeah. So this, for people 
who aren't familiar, usually I think of DNA as a store of information, but here you mean something completely different. You mean literally taking DNA or RNA and folding it into shapes to build structures that are tiny, that perform functions that you're interested in. Yes, yes. So this is what, exactly, this is what the field of DNA origami or DNA mm. nanotechnology is about. It's about taking DNA out of its context in genetics and using it for architecture. So all of this is based on the beautiful work, beautiful work of, of Ned Seenman, who realized, apparently, and this is a small anecdote, if I may. Um, you may. <laughs> this is, uh, he, he claims that he saw a painting by, by Escher. Maybe you know it, the one with the, what, with the staggered fish that seemed to yeah. form a crystal. Um, yeah. So he was seeing this painting and he was thinking, he was a protein crystallographer. Um, he was thinking, you know, what if we... What if we replace the fish by DNA double helices? Mm -hmm. Couldn't we build a crystal of DNA and couldn't we use this to co-crystallize proteins and use this for protein crystallography for proteins that are this difficult to crystallize? And he looked into, into biology and he fo found that nature in nature, you can form nucleic acid branches, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine you have two strands of DNA, mm -hmm. if they are complementary, Meaning if their sequence, if their genetic alphabet matches, they will bind and form a double helix, mm -hmm. right? A binds T, adenine binds thymine, guanine binds cytosine. Um, if the sequences, if the genetic alphabet mat matches, you get a DNA double helix. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine you have got DNA sequences extended from those that are not complementary. Well, then they won't form a DNA double helix. But you're creating a binding site for a third strand of DNA, which can actually bind to these single-stranded overhangs and thereby form something like a Y, right? Mm -hmm. So then with three strands of DNA, you can already engineer by intelligent sequence matching a, a nucleic acid branch. And this is, was Ned Seenman's revolutionary realization that you can actually build nucleic acid, uh, stable nucleic acid branches, like they exist, you know, in a replication fork. For instance, when DNA is replicated, you get, yeah. you get a branch nucleic acid, of course. Uh, yeah. And, and he realized that you can use this kind of, uh, kind okay. of concept for architecture. Um, Can I just stop you, for, just so I understand. So you, you have a double helix, which is matching almost the whole way. Then at the yeah. end, it doesn't match, so it, it's open. And then you can attach single strands to both of those. That, that's the image. Or you can attach one single strand, which matches the two of them, mm -hmm. so to say, like it's half matches the one side, half matches the other side. So mm -hmm. you've got a single strand which connects ah, the two. Yes, I see, I see, I see. So you really have... A Y, right? right? Can you imagine that? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So or, you have three st strands where each one, e the end of each strand is attached to the end of another strand. And so the three come in and form yes. a Y. Yeah, okay. Or let's think about it in a different way. Let's take, let's take this cable over here. Let's, Im let's imagine <laughs> this is a single strand of DNA, mm -hmm. just a single strand. DNA can exist in single stranded form. Think of viruses, for instance, some, some, sometimes they have single stranded genomes. Say this was the genome of, uh, as, as, uh, of a virus, single stranded DNA. Mm -hmm. So now imagine, you know, the sequence of this piece of DNA, you can do that mm -hmm. by sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you wanted to make this DNA close up and form a loop, mm -hmm. what would you do? Well, you could design a short piece of DNA, which is complementary, so sequence complementary, mm -hmm. um, to one end and to the other end. And then this strand of DNA will bind and basically pull the two together. And then you can close this up into a loop, right? Mm -hmm. And now with more of these short pieces, you can actually fold your long strand, single strand of DNA into a desired shape. And this is why the word DNA origami is actually quite fitting because what you're doing is you're folding a long piece of DNA into a desired shape. I see. And this DNA origami idea, this comes from Paul Rothmund, um, where he folded a long single strand of DNA up into a smiley face, um, which was on the <laughs> Nature cover in 2006. So yeah, I have to say, I have to say, 
is really down to a few brilliant minds that 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 started this field and that managed to build an extremely collaborative community around it. So that's what makes it so much fun to work in it, uh, is that, you know, from the beginning on, people cared about sharing um, methodologies, about sharing um, resources. And now, for instance, there's a database uh, which was uh, which was built by... Um, well, uh, by Peter Silk and also um, a postdoc in my group, Eric Poppleton, where you can deposit uh, your your DNA and and others actually, where you can deposit your DNA origami sequences and and you know share them. So it's really a nice a nice community, a nice field to be in. And now, what we kind of or what when I saw the smiley faces, right, and these kind of things, you know, um, in 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 my PhD, I started to already build functional structures. So I was actually building nanopores, nanopores back then for sensing applications. So you know, for for uh, nanopore sensing, you can use uh, nanopores inside of lipid membranes for single molecule detection. So uh, what's a nanopore? What, do you mean like a hole in a something? A hole in the membrane on the nanometer scale. Um, I see. So, so you have some membrane set up uh, like the surface of a cell or something like this, but in, in this case, it's not, right? You Yeah, we make an artificial membrane, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you somehow build these channels or these holes. That, that's what you mean. Exactly. We build a channel. Um, nature builds these channels as well. Nature uses mm -hmm. proteins to build these channels, which can punch holes into lipid membranes. And actually every single cell on planet Earth has such membrane channels and they need these membrane channels as a way to communicate with the environment, right? Mm -hmm. It's a way to, for instance, take up nutrients, exchange information with the environment. And um, so, so, so nanopores or membrane channels exist, exist everywhere. Um, and people realize that actually if you apply a voltage across mm. these channels and you measure a current, you can use such channels inside membranes for single molecule detection. So mm. you can pull molecules through these molecules. You can imagine it like this. They, they kind of clog up the channel, they block it, mm. and then they block the current. And when they are through, they kind of open up the current again. So you can detect single molecules in a label-free way without fluorophores by pulling them through channels. And this was the reason I was actually, you know, going from from smiley faces towards building nanopores or building functional architectures uh, that that create channels inside membranes at that time in the group of, of Ulrich Kaiser in Cambridge. Um, and Ulrich Kaiser was really interested in, in uh, single molecule um, detection, single molecule sensing. And, and for me then eventually I thought, well, if I can build nanopores, can I also build other components of synthetic cells? Can I eventually build, or of cells, can I, can I build cytoskeletons? Can I build other things? And can I eventually build fully functional cells? So this is why, this is actually how... I then transition towards synthetic mm. biology, that the idea that you can, you know, just engineer things from, you know, DNA um, because it's so engin engineerable. So what's the most complex thing you've been able to build? At? What's, what, what are the most impressive shapes you're able to build? Ooh, define, define complexity. Um, I mean, so we've been building these nanopores. Uh, we've also been building mimics of cytoskeletons of cells, so, so DNA filaments, us and others, I should say, um, which which mimic the function of a cytoskeleton inside a cell. Um, these are just for those, who, this is as far as I understand, I'm not a biologist. These are sort of, these are really like the bones or something of, of the cell, right? It gives some because cells, they, they're not just spheres. They move and, and they can deform. And somehow the cytoskeleton gives a, something rigid that the soft parts of the cell can push off. Is that? Is that? Yes. So actually, yeah, the bones of the cell is, I like the analogy a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a good one, but the cytoskeleton does much more than okay. that, right? So it's not, it gives structural support for sure. Um, for instance, by forming a cortex, kind of a layer underneath the cell membrane. Um, it's even involved in cell division. The cytoskeleton helps transport stuff along uh, within the cell. Um, maybe you've seen, maybe 
some of you have seen these cool animations of, you know... Uh, I'll try to put them on screen for those watching. <laughs> of how, of how um, lipid vesicles get transported, you know, like a mm. <laughs> little walk, uh, on, with a little walker along these, along these cytoskeletal filaments. Um, so yeah, the cytoskeleton is involved, involved in a lot of different cellular processes. It's an, it's an amazing structure inside of the cell. Um, we've also been building linkers or or structures when, which can induce the fusion of two lipid vesicles, for instance. Think about growth, like fusion is really important so that you can actually grow the membrane of cells. Um, so yeah, we've, we've really been trying to make a toolbox with DNA nanotechnology of things that we can engineer from scratch, um, such that we get more and more functions of living systems. But there is a but. Um, so I have to say that that most of the structures or all of the structures that we engineer, we first of all have to make them mm-hmm. in the lab, right? And then we put them on the inside of the lipid vesicle and then we check for function, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, But so far, there is no link, no direct link between information and function, right? The synthetic mm-hmm. cell cannot produce these structures. The lipid vesicle cannot produce these structures by itself. And this is now why we are so excited about about RNA origami, because Mm -hmm. with RNA origami, you can use DNA in its natural context. So you can take a gene, so to say, which encodes for an RNA origami, which you, so you take the DNA gene, you copy, you produce RNA from it like a cell would do Mm -hmm. um, by transcription, you say. And then the RNA origami can fold inside of the synthetic cell by by transcription. Um, And so the synthetic cell can produce the functional parts by itself. And so we have genetically encoded the functional parts. And now evolution can act on function. And and this is, I think, where it's starting to get exciting. And this is why we are so excited. Or this is why we also made this big leap from DNA nanotechnology to towards RNA or nanotechnology, because finally, you know, with DNA, oftentimes for function, we also need chemical modification, Mm -hmm. which a synthetic cell could never do, right? A synthetic cell could never attach a certain chemical moiety to a DNA strand, a chemical tag. This this chemistry simply doesn't exist inside of a synthetic cell or a living cell. But RNA is so versatile that we actually get around the need for chemical functionalization. So we can use aptamers, we can use aptamers as structures, which bind small molecules or, or, or other components inside of the synthetic cell. Um, and ribozymes, ribozymes are RNA structures which have catalytic activity. Um, so in that sense, we are very excited about this new branch that, that we are just starting. <laughs> I see. So up until now, you've worked on building things like cytoskeletons, things that link those to the membrane link- linkers yes. and j- channels, components that are sort of well, so far non-dynamic. I guess we can talk about dynamics in a second. And now you want a way for the, for the cell itself to, to generate those. those. You don't have to put them in. Yes. And uh, this is co- kind of a question on the side, but how how well do we understand the link between what is in the DNA or RNA in your case and the form of the cell and what it does as yeah. in the phenotype, I, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. So with DNA and RNA nanotechnology, we basically design the phenotype. Mm-hmm. We design the shape. And it's done by computational design in both cases. So uh, with uh, with uh, DNA origami, for instance, there are software programs that, that exist where you literally sketch out the shape that you want. And then um, the the computer. Uh, then, then you can basically calculate the DNA sequences that you need in order to make up the shape automatically. It's literally click a button, yeah, mm-hmm. and then the program gives you out a list of about two hundred uh, different sequences, which you simply uh, you send this Excel sheet to a company, which produces these two hundred different sequences. Uh, a few days later, you get them in a in a little box. You literally take a pipette, mix them all together, and then heat them up, cool them down slowly, and then you've got billions and billions of copies of the shape that you initially designed in just in just a drop of water, quite literally. Mm. Uh, so this works extremely well um, and extremely, extremely amazing, extremely beautiful, really fascinating mm. to see. Um, 
It's simply, you know, it sounds like magic maybe, right? But all it is is, is, is basically energy minimization, right? The DNA sequences just bind together um, in order to, to have the maximum number of, of, uh, of base pairs formed, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it is, it is quite predictable. There are just four different, uh, I mean, uh, four different nucleic acids. Uh, a, T, C, or G are the letters of the, of the genetic code. Um, there's just four. Um, so it's actually, it's actually quite easy to design um, DNA structures in a completely predictable way. If I draw a smiley face, I get a smiley face. If I draw, uh, if I draw out, um, I don't know, the shape of this, You know, <laughs> I'm holding here a kind of a, a probably holder. nanopore shape as a pen holder, which uh, Luca, uh, okay, soon PhD student in the group, made for me. Uh, thanks, Luca. Um, uh, then, then you get this, right? Um, But then, how stable? So you, so you generate these RNA strands. You, you have them existing in some solution. You heat them up. Well, first of all, why do you need to heat them up and cool them down? And secondly. Are they stable then? If if this is the process that you need, can, can once you've produced them, do they, you know, stay stay in form? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, heat them up, cool them down. It's a process that we call annealing, mm -hmm. um, and we do that simply because imagine if you've got so many strands in solution, um, then there may be some some you know secondary structures that just form. Right, because mm -hmm. there are always some sequence complementarities, right? Mm -hmm. And so basically, we need to heat up to kind of get the DNA in its true single-stranded form, mm -hmm. and then cool down slowly in order for in order for the the best possible match to be found, so mm -hmm. to say, so that we are not trapped in some kind of uh, mm -hmm. local energy minimum, so to say. We want to find the so we we basically cool down slowly in a process where each strand can find its best pos possible match, so to say. Um, mm -hmm. Are they stable? Yes. Once they are folded, um, they are they are typically stable. You can you can keep them for for weeks. You can freeze them and and uh, defrost them later on. And and uh, yeah. They, they are they are definitely more stable than than uh, almost all of the proteins would be. Mm. The beauty again with RNA origami is that we don't need this thermal annealing as we call it. We can actually fold RNA origami co-transcriptionally, meaning by transcription by co by 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 uh, from a DNA template. Um, and fold the, the, the RNA origami as the RNA is produced. So what that means is RNA, DNA origami you typically fold from hundreds of different strands mm -hmm. that come together and form your shape. RNA origami, we design it in such a way um, that, basically, that basically we have just one single strand Mm -hmm. um, just like a protein is made of one single strand of amino acids and this one single strand of amino acids folds up um, as the RNA gets read. And in a similar way, we fold RNA origami. While DNA is red, the RNA that comes out is basically starting to fold up. So this is very interesting because you have to think of the design in a completely different way. You have to think of topology in a completely different way. Oh, so this, this, is, a, this is more like how it would occur in an actual cell then it's like yeah i'm gonna get these words wrong but so the is it the ribosome produces the, the ribosome the, the, produces the protein and it folds up as it's coming as it's coming off the ribosome and so, so you're doing say. the same sort of thing as we are using an uh, a polymerase a t7 uh, rna polymerase which uh, yeah. which makes rna also in a cell mm -hmm. um in a cell typically the rna is more or less linear it's it's the mrna it's the template for the protein so the mm -hmm. rna is used later on by the cell in a completely different way in our case we deliberately design the rna such that it can fold up on itself like a protein would okay and is that sorry just so i understand is that because the rna has matching sequences or is it yeah. or is and they match up or is it because you know that if i have you know atc whatever atg this combination that it will fold in a particular way w what's happening there uh, so you're completely right the sequences are such that they that they basically bind to one another yeah so a again uh, a binds in this case in rna we have we don't have t we have u <laughs> a <laughs> binds u and and g binds c right um And at the same time, there are structural motives in RNA that we can that we can use, such as 
kissing loops that are RNA sequences that turn out and then um, then we use dovetails like a different RNA motifs which kind of help us which we can position in different positions which kind of help us to you know get the topology right so to say um, so this co-transcriptional folding idea um, it was really developed by the group of Ebe Anders and so and and uh, so I should I should uh, put this clearly out there so again you know um, it's cool that you know, there is so much development going on and there, that there are really new kind of things that we can start to be doing that were completely unthinkable a few a few years back. So this really uh, enables us to do uh, what we can now do in synthetic cells all of a sudden. But so the story is that you, you now have a material that you you know how it's going to fold and the structures it's going to form. And this material RNA, it, nat it naturally replicates if you give it some sort of energy source or uh, you're excited about RNA because it- you can, We can produce it, first of all, inside of the synthetic cell. So, um, and we can produce more of it, right? You can make a, a lot of copy numbers from a, uh, from a DNA uh, a DNA duplex, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't it doesn't yet yet self replicate. There is so called uh, self replicating RNA zines. So this is this is RNA which can really just copy itself. So you know, uh, just short piece of RNA that makes a copy of itself, makes a copy of itself, and so on. And is so that the goal one. that you go through this? Eventually, this would be super cool, right? If we can actually make RNA origamis, which can make directly more of themselves. So far, we kind of cheat. Yeah. By uh, by using a DNA template and an RNA polymerase, so one pro one protein, which we have to feed via the environment. So our cells are not, you know, are not. <laughs> this this is an interesting point, right? How autonomous does a cell have to be, right? I mean, how uh, life cannot happen in the vacuum. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, we have to eat essential amino acids, otherwise we die, or we have to eat at all, right? But uh, we, need to we, we have to eat, we have to breathe, right? So we cannot exist in vacuum. We need our environment. We need to take in things from the environment. And, and this is true for all forms of life, right? You may say, okay, a virus... I argue with probably rather not a life, right? Um, but a virus has to take a lot of the machinery of its host cell. So it needs a very complex environment to self-replicate, to be alive, even though it's mm -hmm. not alive. But um, so, so it needs a very complex environment. A cell needs a little less complex environment because it can produce quite a lot of the things that it needs by itself, but it's still not completely autonomous, right? So mm -hmm. our version of a synthetic cell, it will initially feed up on a quite complex environment. So there will, there will be things that we need to bring in. And without this very complex, protective environment, our synthetic cell will not be viable. It won't be, it won't be able to sustain itself, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then I believe that by, by actually letting evolution do its job, you know, mm -hmm. we can reduce the complexity of the environment bit by bit. And this is why I believe it's actually okay to, to feed our synthetic cells at the beginning, mm -hmm. even though the feedstock may be quite complex. My hope is that evolution will get us towards more and more complex and more and more autonomous and more and more robust systems. Well, this is sort of why at the start of the conversation I asked, do we have the environment on earth still for life to initiate? Yeah. Because I, I imagine a situation where right now the environment is very complex. There's competition, but it might've been that back in the day, you don't need an energy store inside your cell because the environment is nice, uh, nice enough. Or the environment provides, for instance, out of equilibrium conditions like dry, wet and dry cycles or heat and uh, heat and cool cycles or, you know, dark and, and, and light cycles, right? Mm. So, so all of these are, are of course, can of course help us to maintain out of equilibrium conditions. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay, so, so far everything we've discussed has been in some sense structural. So we've talked about uh, membranes, we've talked about the cytoskeleton, building these uh, structures. Mm -hmm. But then how do you get dynamics? So do you have something that is some sort of a, an engine that Mm -hmm. moves and, and uh, gives life to these cells? Do you, mm -hmm. and, and what's the energy source uh, mm -hmm. sort of in this direction? Yeah. So let's start a bit historically. Let's take a, a few steps back and, and 
start how how I started to think about this in, in my group, right? Because you're completely right. Like, right, life is about dynamics. If you have something static, it's quite boring. It's not. It's definitely not something we'd call a life. Um, so. The way I started to think about this in my group is, I mean, we come from the field of DNA nanotechnology. We were building DNA nanostructures that were initially passive, right? They had a certain shape. They could do certain things like the nanopores that self-assemble into membranes. But once they are there, they're more or less there, right? They are not, they are not uh, responding, like they're, 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 they're not dynamic. Um, so what, what do we need in order to go from static DNA nanostructures that are just bricks towards dynamic DNA nanostructures? Well, actually, we need to find ways for dynamic reconfiguration. And the field of DNA nanotechnology has, has actually found, has come up with several solutions um, towards reconfiguring preformed DNA structures, so to say. Um, and what, we, what, what it is all about is basically fine-tuning energy landscapes, right? So it's about fine-tuning energy landscapes for the dynamic reconfiguration of these structures to make to a transition from shape A to shape B and potentially back to shape A. Um, so we actually we actually really looked into the details there. Like for instance, we started to we uh, wanted to make a system in the, at the very beginning, historically in my group when we when I just started out as a group leader, we thought about okay, how can we make a, a DNA structure respond to pH? Mm -hmm. um, why pH? Well, pH gradients are actually the universal form of energy generation and energy storage in living cells. So you have Uh, proton gradients, pH gradients are proton gradients that cells have across their membranes. And by dissipating these proton gradients and using an ATPase, these proton gradients are often transformed uh, into ATP, the chemical energy, ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate. Um, but uh, the, the, source of the, the source of energy generation and storage is really proton gradients. So we thought, can we make DNA structures respond to protein gradients? And in literature, uh, we found certain DNA motifs, uh, DNA sequences, which are actually pH responsive. So you can have DNA, we all know DNA as a duplex, DNA duplex, the spiral staircase that, that we see, uh, that we have in our heads when we think of DNA. But actually, DNA can also form triplex structures, where basically a third strand of DNA is wrapped around the duplex. Mm -hmm the DNA duplex. Um, and this is a pH dependent, a pH and sequence dependent uh, phenomenon. And so we thought, okay, can we integrate uh, this uh, pH responsive sequence to make pH responsive structures inside of our synthetic cells? Um, we did uh, actually, even in collaboration, we did uh, molecular dynamic simulations. We saw strange things. We saw that For instance, by changing just the fluorophore on these DNA strands, you can completely change the dynamics. So, so it's a fluorophore. It's a, it's a, we, we like to look at our systems. We like to see them in fluorescence microscopy uh, because they are too small to see otherwise. And this is why we put something that glows at the end of it. So just something that where you can shine light on it, basically you get, you get light back. Uh, and then you can see, you can visualize the structure. Mm -hmm. So basically it we call it a dye or a fluorophore. And we saw that by just changing the modification on our pH responsive structures, we can completely change the steady state and the dynamics of these systems. So then we realized, okay, we can actually use fluorophores to mm -hmm. fine tune energy landscapes for dynamic reconfiguration of these structures. And like this, we started to build more and more different kinds of dynamic structures. So just so I understand, you, you have these uh, triple stranded DNA structures, which when the chemical environment around them changes, they move. When the pH changes, you go from double stranded DNA as we know it to triple stranded DNA. Mm -hmm. And like this, imagine, for instance, you have a double stranded DNA anchored in the membrane of the synthetic cell. So in this, in, in, at the periphery at the at the boundary of the synthetic cell and then you have a third strand of dna that can either be bound mm -hmm. to the membrane to shuttle things to the membrane for instance or deattach mm -hmm. and this attachment deattachment attachment deattachment in a reversible way can be triggered by proton gradients so by 
by by-protons, so to say. So in a similar way, like uh, cells fuel, uh, you know, cells, mm -hmm. uh, uh, proton gradients that are used by cells to fuel. So in the language, uh, so when, when the environment is more or less acidic, mm -hmm. I see. And so, and you can get your, so you can, you can have these DNA structures, which are, mm -hmm. atta you attach in the in the membrane inside the cell, they sort mm -hmm. of span the cell. I imagine. Yeah, or, or are maybe just depends on what kind of function you want to look at. So at that time, we wanted to look at structural stabilization of this compartment itself, or also structural deformation. So we actually had a DNA origami, which uh, can either attach to the membrane at a certain pH mm. or detach from the membrane, and by this we could change the shape of our synthetic cell. So again, thinking of it. the cytoscale, we could watch it, how it goes spherical, deformed, spherical, deformed, okay. spherical, deformed. Um, so, so in that sense, yeah, we can, we can use pH to kind of change the phenotype, if you will, yeah. or the shape of our synthetic cells. And, but again, um, yeah, then, then, then uh, pH gradients is, is, is one mechanism, but you can think of other stimuli, right? And, uh, and for us, always light is a, nice, is a nice stimulus because light is, A, you can imagine that like light dark cycles, you know, finally the sun is shine again, uh, shining again before it was cloudy and raining, you know. So a change of light is something that's very much, you know, physiological or you know, imaginable in, mm -hmm. in, in an environment, so to say. Um, plus, light can penetrate to the inside of our compartment very easily. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually need to change the chemical environment. We can just, you know, turn off the light source of our microscope and turn it on again and turn it off again and turn, turn it on again. So in that sense, light for us is a very nice stimulus. And you can, again, switch or make DNA nanostructures respond to light by uh, inclu including different chemical modifications into the DNA duplex. So for instance, we took azobenzene. Azobenzene mm -hmm. is a molecule which can switch between a certain conformation, its so-called cis state, to its trans state when you illuminate it with UV light. Mm -hmm. um, and like this, uh, it happens to be that, uh, that one of the states is stabilizing the DNA duplex, the other state is destabilizing it. So by shining light on our DNA structures, in this case DNA mm -hmm. cytoskeleton mimics, by turning on and off the light, we can basically assemble and disassemble these structures. So we can have dynamics. The, the one thing that sort of jumps out at me when, when you say by switching light, it doesn't sound autonomous, right? It, it sounds like, you know, you have this external light going on and off. Yeah. Whereas with the proton, sort of the change in acidity inside the cell, it sounds like that would be easier to make autonomous. autonomous. Are you able to get autonomous movement in, in your cells? So in the case of the pH gradients, actually, we made use of E. coli cells, uh, which uh, included uh, included proton pumps, so um, bacterial rhodopsin or xenorhodopsin in that case, which can basically produce proton gradients again upon illumination, right? Yeah. Also, also cells don't, as I said, also cells don't work without their environment, mm -hmm. right? So, so um, yeah, some some kind of environmental input is needed. Yeah, you're completely right. Like autonomous, <laughs> entirely autonomous, is is uh, is in this case not possible. I think what's even worse is that we put a chemical modification on the DNA, azobenzene, right? Mm -hmm. Azobenzene, a cell could never produce DNA <laughs> with other ben azobenzene, right? Mm. Luckily, we are, we, are, we are not, I'm not a chemist, I couldn't produce it either, but luckily there are companies that make DNA that's modified with these kind of molecules, right? Yeah. So, but a cell could never make this. So our synthetic cell could never make this. And this is why, again, why I believe that going towards RNA origami or going towards RNA, which is chemically so much more versatile, we can include these kind of dynamics, but without necessarily needing complex chemical modifications that a cell could not make. And um, yeah, so yes, we are cheating on different levels. I completely agree with you. On, on different levels, we are making our lives easy and just, you know, uh, trying to build things that work. And I don't think it's cheating. This, this is, <laughs> so, so just so I understand, you have a membrane with the structures, the dynamic structures inside, and when, when you're looking at the proton gradient approach, you said you, you take E. coli. So this is 
you also have that bacterial inside the cell. So you, so you have bacterial cells inside your cell and, and those cells, are Res they engineered to do something? or They are genetically engineered. So in a way you could call it top-down engineered. Mm -hmm. So we took top-down synthetic biology to engineer these E. coli such that they overproduce uh, xenorhodopsin that, that, you know, creates these proton gradients. Um up on light illumination and yes we use them as a as a way to fuel our system so um but this is what this is like mitochondria right so this is like a mitochondria th this i mean is, this yeah is, you're completely for, right for, for people who this is actually um <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories in biology are you able to explain a little bit about how we ended up with mitochondria because cool. we're, we're, we're sort of if this is too far out of uh, field but we're hybrids right this is <laughs> So this is me, a physicist, trying to explain the origins of mitochondria, which is uh, which is taking me out of my comfort zone. But basically, the hypothesis or the acknowledged hypothesis here is that that basically free living bacteria were eventually uptaken, um, and you can see this actually because mitochondria have two membranes, right? So mm -hmm. in the uptake process, you 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 kept the second membrane that you know you had when oh, the it cells pu it fused. pushed through the yeah. cell and yeah. then absorbed and then you have, the yeah. I didn't know that. Um, and and so so basically, there is a, a number of reasons. Cell nucleus is the same thing. There's a number of reasons for us to believe that the origins of eukaryotic cells actually um, are down to the uptake, like cells that that we are made of. So this is with a nucleus. Cells with a nucleus and uh, cells with a cytoskeleton, okay. cells with mitochondria, the kind of cells that mammals are are made of. Okay. Um, mammals and yeah so that that we are kind of hybrids yeah <laughs> okay so so you have you, you have uh structures for rigidity and and movement you you have uh an energy producer i, I guess in in the form of your own uh synthesized mitochondria using, <laughs> well if you uh, call them that way uh, how do you had you also have uh, cell division, right? Yes. So cell division. Let's let's get to cell division. Right. I mean, cell division is an interesting one, right? Because it's so cell division is somehow a key part of life, right? You could never call something a life without without replication. Um, mm -hmm. So. So cell division was quite high up on our list, right? We wanted to be able to divide our lipid vesicles. Mm -hmm. um, now, you could think about, okay, how do cells do it? Well, cells oftentimes use a, their cytoskeleton that we talked about earlier. Um, oftentimes you would actually bundle cytoskeletal filaments, which then form a ring um, at, the, at the periphery of the cell. And then this ring contracts and splits one cell into two. Right. It's quite a complex machinery that, that actually does that. Um, and there's quite a lot of work in the bottom-up synthetic biology field um, on finding a minimal set of components which are, is actually sufficient to divide lipid vesicles, right? Um, to find a machinery to divide lipid vesicles. And um, it's an ongoing field of research. It's unclear which... Uh, which uh, which components exactly we need and uh, we get now to a point where we have two vesicles connected with a close close neck you know but not not really fission so um there as i say the cells have, to, have evolved complex machinery so we thought okay can we actually engineer something much simpler um now there are two ways i said we have a dna cytoskeleton right so an obvious thing to do would be to take our dna cytoskeleton do what cells do bundle it which we can do by molecular crowding or by synthetic crosslinkers. We engineered synthetic crosslinkers, which can crosslink our DNA, DNA filament, so to say. Um, we put them in a vesicle. We could show that in the presence of molecular crowders, for instance, we get ring formation in the lipid mm -hmm. vesicles, right? Simply by molecular crowding. And now um, we actually thought about ways to make these rings contract, mm -hmm. and we were actually able to contract the D the bundled DNA filament rings to about half of their diameter um, but this is not this uh, so far we haven't been able to put this into lip lipid vesicles let alone let a vesicle divide mm -hmm. based on our own dna based machinery so this is still this is still uh, quite complex and we are not there yet 
But since division is so up on, uh, high up on our priority list, we need it, right, to move on towards evolution, for instance, right? Um, we wanted to think of shortcuts. So we literally went back to the, to the drawing board um, and thought, okay, What do we actually need for division? Well, if you think about it as a physicist again, um, if you want to take one compartment and turn it into two, somehow you need to change the surface to volume ratio, right? Because two small compartments have a larger surface compared to their volume compa compared to the initial mother compartment, so to say. Now, we thought, okay, how can you change the surface to volume ratio? Well, either you make more surface um, by producing more lipids. Our synthetic cells can't do that. So what's the other way? Well, we can change the surface to volume ratio by osmosis. So by basically taking out water from our lipid vesicles so that they kind of shrink, so that we, we have excess membrane area and enough membrane area so that the vesicle can actually divide into two. So that's so number you, one. So you put them in a salty environment or something like this? We put them in a sal more salty environment um, or more sugary environment. Uh, actually, this is what we did. We put them into a more sugary environment. You know, everyone likes sugar. We actually uh, we actually fed them extra sugar. Um, and then we added an enzyme called invertase, um, which breaks up the sugars and is thereby dub doubling the number of particles in solution. Mm -hmm. The number of particles in solution is what we call the osmolarity. So it's basically doubling the osmolarity in each reaction step, so making more and more sugars. Yeah. And then uh, in the process, the vesicles would shrink um, or the vesicles would have excess membrane area. Enough excess membrane area in principle for division. Now, um, you can calculate how much membrane area that is. You can build a simple theoretical model, simply just a uh -huh. geometrical model. Um, this was done by uh, Yannick Drea in the group who, who was basically writing down the equations. And, and uh, you, can, you, can then, uh, you can then see that the osmolarity ratio between inside and outside of the lipid vesicle that you need in order to make two out of one is square root of two. Mm -hmm. So basically, you need to to change the outer osmolarity by a factor, factor of 1.41 equals square root of two. Um, and then somehow you need to tell the lipid vesicle where to divide, right? If you have got a spherical object, like what do you want to do? You somehow need to, you somehow want to make two equally sized compartments in the end. Um, and then again, we looked into, into theory a little bit um, and we found uh, two ways. Um, so one of them is to make use of lipid-lipid phase separation. So what that means is that we make our lipid vesicles out of a complex lipid mixture so that the lipid lipids start to demix into a liquid ordered phase and a liquid disordered phase. And then we've got a so-called line tension at the domain boundary. So the domains just want to demix. And what this leads to is that you basically, that you basically um, want to minimize the contact area between the two lipids. And this means that the vesicle deforms in the way that we want. It contracts in its center and then splits up into two. I see. So you, you have a membrane which chemically, is it chemically? It, it has two different phases. It has so two, two different, different types or has multiple different types of lipids that simply want to want to demix exactly like actually this exists in cellular membranes as well in cellular membranes you've got patches um mm -hmm. so-called lipid rafts that that are liquid ordered uh, lipids in the liquid ordered phase lipids in the liquid disordered phase so also cells their membrane their compartment mm -hmm. is not made of a single type of lipids and we just did the same for our lipid vesicles instead of using a sim single type of lipids we just used a more complex lipid mixture which has this property that it starts to phase cells Separate. So if I get the picture right, you, you have these uh, cells, these membrane mm -hmm. surrounded cells um, in some liquid yeah. and you make the external environment and, and the membrane has these two parts. You make the external environment more sugary and that causes liquid to go from the inside of the cell to the outside. Mm -hmm. so, it so the surface area to volume ratio increases. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so eventually you get the contraction of the uh -huh. internal layer and it separates into two. It separates uh, into two, but, yeah. But, uh, so then I have two questions. Does this mean that the cells are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller each generation? Yes. And, and you have to make the, for every generation you have to, you said you have to make it more sugary, the external environment for each uh, subsequent generation? 
to get the os- osmotic process to continue. Mm-hmm. I see. So, uh, okay, wait. So yes, they they shrink basically after division. A cell also after division. First of all, the two daughter compartments are smaller. This is also true for mm-hmm. for a living cell, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, basically, you need a mechanism. Division alone is not enough. You need a mechanism for regrowth, mm-hmm. right? And in our case, we just feed extra lipids. We can oh, grow okay. compartments by feeding them extra lipids, you know, like so, like uh, so eating fatty. Like after the sugary diet comes the fatty diet, so to say. But, but so, okay, so, so uh, once, you, are once you have a, sorry for interrupting you. Once you have a cell that's formed, you can in some, it's somehow uh, easier to then make a bigger cell for, for starting just by feeding them lipids. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. So we basically, again, it is. There's, of course, many, many details to this. It's a very superficial picture that we are painting here. So um, what, we are, what we are doing in this case is we are actually using, again, DNA nanotechnology to fuse the respectively other type of lipid. We have preformed liposomes and so on. So it's not like we can just, you know, uh, divide, grow in multiple mm-hmm. cycles yet. So we are, not, we are not there yet, right? So, but conceptually... Yeah. There are ways to actually think about this and there are ways to get there, um, I believe. Um, because what this tells us in the end is that division is not so unachievable. Is that actually all you need is osmotic gradients mm-hmm. and is line tension or there's a second way of doing it, uh, spontaneous curvature, so membrane curvature. So, um, and this you can actually get in quite simple ways. So for instance, membrane curvature, you can simply get by absorbing things on the membrane. This alone is inducing curvature. Now, if you think about it, I told you that we can absorb DNA nanostructures on the surface of lipid vesicles and that this can change the curvature, it can change the shape of the lipid vesicle. Mm -hmm. So now you see, if you put now these uh, these kind of worlds together, so to say, um, you could see how you could potentially dream about genetically encoding division, right? Imagine Mm -hmm. you have a DNA gene which encodes for an RNA origami, which changes the curvature, and then, you know... uh, then you could basically th- dream about genetically encoding division. But yeah, and then you need regrowth and, and all of that. So there are steps to be taken, but there's also, I think, clear solutions of how we can get there. And this is mm. this is what I'm saying. Um, there's one step I don't quite understand. So you can, um, you can regrow the outer lipid membrane, mm-hmm. but then how do you refill them with liquid on the inside? Do you, do you then... Um, dilute the sugary external environment so that then the osmotic process goes back in the other direction? How do you... Yeah, I mean, in the growth process itself, you can basically take care of that because when you feed small liposomes, tiny, tiny, tiny lipid bubbles, you can fill them with the exact right, or you could think about filling them with the exact right solution so that you kind of balance it out uh, in the inner growth process, so Mm -hmm. to say. So you can can take care of that uh, while growing, so to say. Um, And I should, I I would like to actually actually point towards a slightly different point because, you know, um, I I told you that this division process, right, it happens at an osmolarity ratio of square root of two, which may seem you know <laughs> kind of kind of interesting right the bottom line here is we can describe it extremely well um, and we realized that when we were describing it so well right we we realized that actually what we have created is a sensor okay we have created a sensor for osmolarity because now if you think about it if we just have a microscope image of our lipid vesicle we see its shape and from its shape, we can deduce exactly what mm. osmolarity the surrounding environment has to have. Now, if you think about it, this is quite powerful because current osmometers, like the technological devices that we have standing around in our labs, are normally so-called freeze-point osmometers, which require freezing of the sample. This is why, mm. for instance, in a cell culture uh, experiment, you can never actually measure osmolarity. You have to take something out, go to this device, and then freeze it, and then uh, things are dead, and you know you can you can start over again. Um, but with this mechanism, simply by looking at the shape of our s- synthetic cell of our lipid vesicles, we can deduce what osmolarity the solution has. And we are anyway watching them in the microscope. So in principle, what we have developed is not just 
a simple and quite reliable mechanism to divide lipid vesicles is also an osmolarity sensor. And I'm making this point because people always ask me, like, ah, you know, what you do is nice. It's kind of dream. It's kind of, you know, blue skies and, and curiosity driven research. And I want to make this pitch for for curiosity driven research, because if you had because there are technologies that we discover on the way that are kind of unpredictable. So if you had told me build an osmolarity sensor, maybe I would have taken the sensor that is already existing. Maybe I would have come up with some very slight improvements to that, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if at all. Um, but certainly I wouldn't have come up with something entirely, entirely new, right? So innovation often comes from the most unexpected fields, right? And so the point that I'm trying to make is While you're doing curiosity-driven research, you sometimes stumble ac across applications in the most unexpected areas. You know, like Henry Ford said, if I had asked the people what do you want, they would have said, uh, I want faster horses, and he would never have invented the car, right? Mm. And in a similar way is how I see our research, right? I dream about the synthetic cell. And once we are there, I'm sure we can talk about applications of that later. I'm sure this is such a, you know, such a cornerstone for humanity, you know, it's amazing. But we are not there yet. Doesn't matter because the journey towards it is worthwhile mm. um, because we are developing technologies that we simply stumble across and we patent them, we follow up on them um, and we are, trying to, we are trying to make the world benefit from it, right? Um, before, long before we can make any promises what will happen with the synthetic cells in the future. And I'm sure amazing things will happen, by the way, but maybe later on. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about dreams in a second. But uh, so these structures... We'll talk about packaging them together and, and getting an actual uh, living organism uh, in a second as well. But so you have a process for cell division that's very different to using the cytoskeleton to mm, uh, mm. do cell division just because it's too complicated at the moment. And then you have these other structures that are functionally very mm -hmm. similar to the way that real cells uh, function, but are quite different. And so what I'm curious about, what I, what I wonder is... What at the end of the day, if you were successful and and you built built functioning cells using all of these weird and wonderful new methods, mm -hmm. what would that mean for the organism? So let let's say for example, you you might not have even thought about this, but let's let's say for example we had some large organism uh, like a human like animal that had its cell divisions occurring using this Bye. process. <laughs> so what, what would that alien animal look like at the end of the day? Do you have any idea? Have you thought about this? Of course, we are not trying to create a second human yet, just to, <laughs> just to get the ethics side of things a bit clearer. But we could talk about that as well. Um, so, I mean, okay, I think there's reasons why biology came up with these complex mechanisms or why evolution uh, has has evolved why we have evolved towards complex mechanisms because they allow for gr for a great deal of regulation right mm -hmm. and in a complex organism i think regulation um is key right you need to be able to regulate things you you need to have error correction mechanisms and so on and so forth right so It's not by chance that that cell cell division is is complex in the end in inside of a inside of a living cell inside of a human organism let's say, um, and um, but basically what what such simple mechanisms as the one that we developed can um, can bring us is you know questions that we can direct towards biologists right we can start to ask okay hmm a Is it a mechanism that could have been at play at the origins of life? For instance, when the first phospholipids emerged in these, you know, fatty acid type vesicles, mm -hmm. could there have been, maybe there was phase separation, maybe this was a way of division. Like we can direct questions to the origins of life field. At the same time, we can direct questions to biologists who are interested to study life as it is. We can ask, okay, if cell division is highly reg regulated, maybe there are other processes inside of a cell where 
simple lipid compartments have to butt up, off, for instance, in the process of the generation of extracellular vesicles or when vesicles butt off the endo endoplasmatic reticulum or so. And maybe there, phase separation or spontaneous curvature or simple physical effects like this may be at play. And actually, um, it's interesting. Uh, it is, for instance known or, or it has been studied that the HIV virus, it enters the cell at such a phase boundary mm -hmm. because it's like a little defect, you know, it's a little defect that makes entry just a little bit easier, right? And so, you know, even though cells may have their complex mechanism for reasons, there may be processes in which simpler mechanisms are still at play and we may, you know, we may oversee them in all this complexity. So, so by studying very much simplistic uh, model systems, we can actually find out which physical mechanisms are at play in much, much more complex biological systems or may be at play. And then we can go out there and try and find them, right? Or our colleagues. <laughs> well, so then in terms of packaging all these ideas together, when can you give some sort of a roadmap? When do you think you will have a functional synthetic cell, something that you would call life. You, you know, how, how long is it before you can put all these tools together, put them into a box and print out, 3D print out uh, a cell? Is it in your lifetime or? Okay, so these predictions are extremely dangerous, right? And I, I see myself listening to this podcast uh, <laughs> a year after my retirement or so, you know, and then killing myself for what I say now. Um, but, you know, like, on, quite honestly, like, personally, I wouldn't be in this field if I didn't have the strong sense that actually I will be able to witness it within my scientific career or within my lifetime. It may be, may be us doing it, it may be others. And as I say, there are different approaches, right? You can come up, bot you can come up top down. Um, you know, if they if they manage to make a, a, cas a, a chassis, kind of a, an enclosure that can that is not taken from a cell or, or fabricated by a cell, but maybe you know produced also by the by the machinery that we have at hand. Um, or you, we have the the people who use in vitro transcription translation. So you use the protein machinery, the 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 central dogma of molecular biology that we talked about and and try and find a minimal set of genes upon which we can generate a living system then we have us who are trying to take lipid vesicles but engineer our own molecular hardware then we have the systems chemistry crowd you know so there are there are kind of parallel lines that are trying to move towards the same goal namely the creation of life from the non-living and i have the strong sense that we are not that far away, actually, and that we will will be getting there. And this is why I think it's exciting to to be in the field. Um, I feel like I think Sibir and Otto once said this: like um, in systems chemistry, in, in 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 synthetic chemistry, there was a point when people were thinking, scientists were thinking, it's not actually possible to create organic molecules from scratch, like something like. Urea, the thing that comes out when mm. we pee, <laughs> is, uh, has to be created by a living, uh, a, a living organism, right? Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, we know, no, 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 urea can be made synthetically in the lab, and so can many, many other organic molecules. And I feel like we may be at a similar point, and this was, this was also what uh, this was uh, Sibrian Otto's point, actually, is, is uh, we may be at a similar point now in, in synthetic biology, right? A proof of principle is needed to kickstart this entire new field of research. And I think we shouldn't be aiming just for life 2.0, right? But maybe 3.0, 4.0, 5.0. So, you know, the, let the, let the top-down crowd go its way. Let the, let the uh, central dogma crowd go its way. Let the uh, uh, DNA origami, RNA origami hardware crowd go its way. Let the systems chemistry crowd go its way and just create many, many different forms. And I think actually maybe all of those we may hopefully be able to see within, you know, our, mm. our lifetimes. At least this would be super exciting. And, you know, it's just cool to be in this field at this moment of time. I mean, where we are allowed to ask a question, which was for so, so many centuries, a question that philosophers and maybe theologists mm. or whatever were asking already, right? It's a, so, it's, I think it's ingrained in our brains and mankind, right? We want to understand what life is. We want to understand what we are, right? So mm. such a fundamental question that we have the, the chance to work on now from a natural science perspective, which I think is just, just amazing. So then does it give you insight in the way that life evolved 
to become us, our complex organisms, right? So let, let me be more specific with the question. What do you think the hardest step is before you, you get there? And does that give you some insight into what the hard steps were going from, you know, the spark of life to what mm -hmm. we now have mm -hmm. uh, on earth? So actually this year, earlier this year, uh, we sat down together with around 60 people for two weeks uh, in, in mm -hmm. Munich um, and, and two of my colleagues, Christoph Weber um, and Jo Birkhoven and I, we organized a conference on the engineering of life where we basically discussed exactly these questions for, for two weeks with 60 <laughs> people from the field. And we came up actually with not one, but 10 different challenges that we need to somehow address in the field um, and that, that we need to be working on towards, uh, towards the creation of life. One is, uh, one is, for instance, and this is, this is what I see as, as very, very important, the establishment of open-ended evolution, basically to get to a point where evolution can kick in. Mm -hmm. um, so this this is uh, one that I'm very passionate about, but there are, but there as I say there are there are definitely others. Um, will this be able? I think this was your second question. Will this be able to tell us what the hard steps were in the origins of life? Mm -hmm. Yes and no, because I think the way we are approaching it is fundamentally different, right? Like life, ne uh, nature never wanted to create life, right? Like it was kind of a random walk process, right? Evolution is not designed to, to make things better. Evolution is trying things out and, you know, certain things work, certain things don't. There's a lot of garbage there and, you know, eventually you end up with something that works. But what we can do is we have a clear goal. This is also why I believe it won't take us for uh, billions of years. We may actually be faster because we have a clear goal. We are not doing only a random walk. We can actually use more like a directed evolution process. So we can drive the system towards a user-defined goal. We can drive the systems to, uh, towards, say, evolving a mechanism for, you know, e evolving a certain component that you can, uh, that you don't need uh, a complex environment anymore or so. Um, so in that sense, I think we may be much faster, but in principle, of course, like from, from a very fundamental point of view, there are a lot of similarities in, in the process. And, and yeah, certainly talking with people who are interested in evolution, who are interested in the origins of life and so on and so forth is very, very fruitful um, for, for us as well. So then what do you think nature's biggest invention was what what are you most impressed that nature was able now that you've been trying to build these things yeah and you see how difficult they are is there something that really stands out to you where you just wow how did nature do that i mean okay we as as humans i think we're constantly fascinated by nature right um i mean i guess i guess one thing that's that's quite remarkable is that we didn't get stuck at the early phases of life, right? You can easily think about um, about very simple, almost parasitic, um, self-replicating machines that are just super fast, but also super simple. Right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that nature started to occupy different niches and thereby also evolve greater complexity, ever greater complexity in an open-ended way, like not get stuck with something that's actually quite simple and just... Mm -hmm takes over the world so to say and um, this is this is quite impressive so oftentimes people name the origins of the eukaryotic cell as such you know a real a real transition point where all of a sudden which all of a sudden gave rise to the diversity of life that we see around us right there's not just bacteria that all look quite you know in a way quite similar they are biochemically maybe diverse but but uh, can do many different things are very interesting but you know if we look around us, if we just look around us, we see trees, we see humans, we see ants, we see, you know, and, and, and this is just amazing, right? Um, I, I think. Um. So this is, again, a question that may be so out of... <laughs> <laughs> Where are the aliens, essentially? Do, do you think, you know, that there's this question, uh, when you look out, we don't see mm. aliens on other planets, right? At least the planets were visited. And so, so do you think that we will eventually find life outside of Earth? How special are we here? <laughs> We're back to the question, how, how special are we, right? Like, I mean, yeah, I, again, as I, as I said earlier, I don't think that we are that special every time we try to claim that we were proven wrong. So 
again, and it's now personal speculation, not based on any scientific research that 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 I do is, is yes, I, I believe aliens are out there. I believe at least, you know, at least simple forms of life, right? Like that that are capable of self-replication and, and evolution. I would be surprised if that's not the case, right? Um when we find them, I don't know. <laughs> so a related question is, you know, we, we, we so far haven't received signals from some intelligent form of life. And so you might say people say there's perhaps these filtering events that stop us from, that stop creatures from getting to the point where they might be able to send out a signal. If, if there was a filtering event, where do you think it is in, in the, is it behind us or is it ahead of us? Do you think it's, um, again, this is a pretty out there question, but uh, what was the hardest step in in getting to the life that we see on the planet, the diversity we see on the getting planet? Getting towards intelligence. You mean. Yeah. It, was Sorry. it photosynthesis? Was it multicellularity? What, what was it? I guess... I mean, <laughs> I guess you could you could start to calculate like all right, what a what a stochastically speaking, like what are what are chances of certain things to occur, right? Mm -hmm. What are chances of you know of something like a eukaryotic cell to emerge? What are chances of multicellularity to emerge? What are chances of? Um, I mean, this all is stochastics, right? And I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess you can look back at the record and see how long it took for multicellularity. You can see how long it took for various yeah, steps. Yeah, so this is n equal one, right? Which is yeah, bad okay. statistics. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So especially in a, in a stochastic process, right? You mm. you know that yeah, you're right, right? Like yeah, yeah. There there must be some cor there, or there's likely some correlation of how hard something is to achieve and how long it takes, right? But mm. at the, and, and and yes, like in an evolutionary landscape, if A and B are far apart, then you cannot just jump from A to B. Uh, mm. It's always a continuous trajectory. It's a continuous path that you have to take in this evolutionary landscape. So. Um, and then there are discontinuous events, right? Like, like, like. Um, okay, you just accumulate something from a different species, like, like the emergence of of my mitochondria or so, right? Um, but um, yeah, so I guess there there must be some correlation. But n equal one is not very good statistics to to really mm. to really draw conclusions. I you guess. know, in some sense. Okay, I understand. We have one Earth. <laughs> uh, we can look at life. Uh, in, in some sort of general overview sense, and then we have n equals one. But on the other hand, we have billions and billions and billions of organisms that are going through evolution, right? So, is, is n equal one? <laughs> you know, really? I mean, it's it's. I guess it takes. Uh, I guess it depends at what stage you look right. Mm. Uh, you look at right. You're completely right. Once. Once we're post Luca, Luca, this last universal common ancestor mm -hmm. that gave rise to all of life around us, right? Then, yes, then we can follow evolutionary tra trajectories of different mm -hmm. species and so on and so forth. But the question is, what led us to this point, right? Mm -hmm. What is the kind of big bang of life, so to say? Like, what, what, uh, uh, what happened really at the origins? And there we have n equal one and not even good data on that right if we're honest mm -hmm. um so so yeah this is why i have so much hope in these kind of engineering approaches where you know maybe we can for we don't need to understand every detailed bit of how things were on early earth maybe we can take our own set our own toolbox of molecular components and and you know just think about n equal two, three, four, five, six, right? And and maybe this can can teach us a lot about mm. about this big bang of <laughs> big bang type event. So I want to move towards the end of the conversation, and I had a few questions to ask just to wrap up the story. And so one of the things that you meant, so you mentioned a few applications. Yeah. Um, are there 
any applications that you haven't mentioned that you're particularly excited about? And mm-hmm. are there some dream applications uh, in the future, sort of looking further out that that you suspect might be on the horizon? Mm-hmm. So what I really enjoy about being in the field of of bottom-up synthetic biology or about this idea of trying to create life from the non-living, a cellular life from the non-living, is that we are developing technologies that are directly applicable. And in particular, what I enjoy a lot is the fact that the molecular hardware that we are creating, say from DNA origami, is a really nice biophysical tool that biologists, biophysicists can use to study life as it is. And so in Heidelberg, for instance, we are very much interested in synthetic immunology. So in using these kind of platforms to study immune response, to study, you know, how how uh, how we can control uh, immune responses, how we can potentially engineer better vaccines. And so there's so much, uh, so much medicine, so much biology going on around us and so many people who are fascinated by the new tools that we are creating and happy to reuse the parts that we that uh, that we need towards our big dream um, already towards uh, towards applications right now um, I mentioned the examples of osmolarity sensors in my lab we also we also worked on 3d printing inside of synthetic cells uh, through this we developed now a new image based uh, image based selection and sorting methodology that we are taking forward for single cell sorting for instance um, uh, done by work done by Tobias Avela and Stefan Maurer in the group so there is really lots of different different technologies that we can that we can put out there long before we can put our synthetic cell uh, mm. out there. And now, if we think about the end goal, and if we think about why we are excited about the synthetic cell itself, is because I believe once we have something, once we have this cellular entity, which is capable of self-replication and evolution, again, we can use directed evolution to evolve it towards user-defined goals, mm. be it the detection of a virus or a pollutant or whatever it may be, or be it, you know, the growth of a certain structure that we need for construction material purposes, right? So once we have a synthetic cell, we can venture into all of these diverse applications. And I am also sure that others will then jump on it and, you know, try and cr- t- try and use these synthetic cells and evolve them towards applications of, of their own. Um, you know, so just, just give the right prompt and, and nature and, and evolution will, will, will do it and get us there. Right. Uh, so once we are there, I, I think the horizon is just, just infinite, right? Um, <laughs> the, so you mentioned earlier in the conversation about the ethics, right? Yeah. So obviously you you apply for funding, you apply for grants, and yeah. Sort of thing, and I, I imagine on those forms there's like an ethics form, right? Usually there is. There is so, an ethics form, yeah. So, so what what do you have to fill out there? Is because people this will definitely get comments of people saying um, people always talk about you know this is not right, it's against. Yeah. You know, um, do do you have first of all anything to say uh, mm-hmm. on on the topic of, um, you know, it's it's against n- nature this sort of mm-hmm. direction. Do, mm-hmm. have, have you thought uh, much along these lines? Absolutely. Like, I mean, this is a this is a continuous discussion that we are having in the field. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's also one of it's actually two of our ten challenges that we put out there as a community as well. Is how do we first of all communicate in this uh, about this kind of research that is not misunderstood, and secondly, what are the ethics, right? What are the ethics behind it? Mm-hmm. And um, so, in our consortia, for instance, we always have experts on the ethics side of things as well, because um, obviously we are we are scientists. We uh, we our, it is our duty to communicate about what we do, but then it's the the duty of us as a society and of experts in in the ethics field and so on to morally judge what we are doing, right? Mm-hmm. And and so for this, first of all, clear communication is is key. Um, at the same time, we have to think about uh, think about regulation in in the long term, right? Right now, we are playing with molecules. So right now we are not doing much uh, things that are much different than what a chemist is doing. A drop of dish soap will destroy everything we've made, <laughs> right? Um, so, in a sense, our 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 
lipid vesicles containing some form of molecular hardware are so fragile, mm. so unbelievably fra fragile that they cannot be a threat right at this mm. at this moment. Um, but of course, we have to think ahead, and we have to think decades ahead and think about potential uses of these kinds of technologies, right? Um, so this is a debate that's going on in 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 the field of of top down synthetic biology, where we are actually engineering and tinkering with existing form of life, genetic engineering, mm. like all of these kind of fields. Um, and this is a debate that is very much had inside of our field as well. And um, I think we have to be clear about our goals. We have to be clear um, about the kind of things that we do want to do, but also about the kind of things that we don't want to do. And yes, getting together as a community and thinking about regulation is really key because at the moment, you mentioned the ethics forms and proposals, right? They always deal with life. So, you know, in the forms you're asked, are you going to work with genetically modified organisms? No, we are not. Because we are building organisms. We, we, are, we, are not, we are not, we are not working. This is the one exception. This is the yeah. one time. Yeah. Um, we are not actually, we are not actually working with life per se, right? We are, we are mm. creating molecules. And as such, uh, as such, basically, um, at what point do regulations that exist for life have to be applied to our systems? I think mm -hmm. this is the question at the essence, because there are ethical guidelines that deal with life as it is, right? So at one point, do our systems fall under these regulations? These are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. And mm -hmm. do these regulations need to be adapted uh, for uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of things that we do? Yes. But you're you're not you're not worried about releasing something from the lab that then takes over the world because they're so fragile that they just wouldn't survive outside of the very constrained environments that I mean not that you have a replicating exactly uh, we don't have a yeah so we we are definitely far 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 away from far 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 away from that. Um, I'm not saying I'm not concerned because, of course, you should be concerned about things that are even in the far future, right? And this is exactly why we are having these kind of debates right now, right? Because um, it doesn't help if I say I'm not concerned now. It's true. Mm. But you also have to think ahead and you have to think about generations ahead and so on. And so this is why I think it's 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 really nice that the community is open to have these kind of discussions and also the the, science, the scientists uh, in the field are open to have these kind of these kind of mm -hmm. discussions and and yeah we have to we have to develop this over time and we have to constantly ask the public what do you think about what we are doing right mm. the public tells me look this doesn't work this this is not something we want to do like like it has happened to 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 uh, certain types of certain fields of research in the past then i have to ask myself am i commu clearly communicating what i'm actually doing mm. minimal model of a cell maybe i'm using the the wrong wordings maybe a synthetic life is is this maybe can this be misunderstood mm. do i have to talk this is why i like the term of model systems right it's very mm. simple it's very um this is what we are really doing, right? So is it my terminology or is it a general fear that is just out there and that we then have to acknowledge as scientists, right? Have, and what, do you know what the response has been? Do you have, you have, do you get emails from people in the public? What, what does it look like? So we often go out, right? I, I like to go out and talk to the public, right? So I've given uh, lots of public talks. Uh, we also, via um, a platform that we set up, bring a scientist. Um, we invite school classes to join us via um, via web video conferencing, you know, to see what the lab is like, to, to talk to, to me, to others, uh, what kind of uh, research we are doing. Um, um, and the fee the feedback has been that people are it's inherent in human curiosity people are inherently curious about the question what is life is it possible to build life right mm. so i would say there is a lot of enthusiasm for this kind of research out there but there have also been the incidents where people ask me so are you playing god mm -hmm. are you playing god right and and what do you answer <laughs> <laughs> i i answered i I try to explain clearly what I'm doing, mm. right? And that it's not my, you know, you, everybody has to make up their own mind. I don't think, I don't think I'm playing God. I think I'm playing with molecules. I think I'm, <laughs> <laughs> but, but 
of course you have to ask the people out there in the end mm. um it's, and it, i don't want to play down the i don't want to i don't want to stop the conversation right by saying no i'm not right? i want to start the conversation in some sense it should be reassuring to people that might have these concerns that at the beginning when i asked if you created life 2.0 whatever we want to call it Uh, what would you call it? And you didn't immediately have an answer, right? It should be, it should be reassuring that this is. It it doesn't sound like you are trying to play God in some sense. You're curious about the engineering of cells, yeah. and and it's a minimal cellular entity, right? It's a thing. It's not like we are creating a homunculus or a second version of a human being, right? It's about it's about the fundamental single cell that it's a minimal model of a single cell. So in that sense, a lot of the ethical concerns that are, for instance, related to engineering of, of, of existing organisms or, you know, uh, of embryos and so on, they don't directly apply because it's a single cell. We are talking a single cell and that in itself is complex enough, right? It's complex enough and, and um, you know, uh, and interesting enough um so i would say most people say for most people the curiosity about life and the essence of life and so on dominates when 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 i talk to them and this is reassuring to see um that yeah that that curiosity prevails and persists at the beginning you mentioned that there's sort of this craig venter approach Right, mm -hmm. where, where you you take a cell and you strip it down as far as possible to the most basic Bare components minimum. where we still have some sort of replication going on. And then you have your approach, which is bottom up, where, where you try, you're starting from scratch mm -hmm. and you don't mind so much about the materials that you're using as long as you can get the functionality working. There's sort of a, another approach that you could go down where you start with a cell mm -hmm. and you take out a component and you replace it with something synthetic. And then you, you do sort of like, a, what's it called? This in, infinity ship where over time you replace every single component uh -huh, uh -huh. one at a time. Yeah. Have you thought about going this route as opposed to going yeah. from bottom up? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess this is kind of almost like a merger of top down and bottom up. And people are certainly certainly thinking about this in a way It is a little bit what has been done, right? This, uh, the, the, for the top-down approach, the genome of mm -hmm. that cell, it was okay. It was the alphabet that, that existed in the living cell, but it was chemically synthesized in the lab and mm -hmm. then put into an empty bacterial cell, so to say, mm -hmm. right? So this thing in itself, well, the genetic alphabet was taken from nature, the genome was taken from nature or derived from nature, but it was chemically synthesized, right? And of course, you can now ask, okay, um, can I now also boot this kind of genome inside of a lipid vesicle or something that we is assembled from scratch? So something that wasn't assembled by nature, but something that we assembled in the lab, right? So the bacterial the bacterial um, container was assembled by nature, by, by an existing bacterium. So every cell on earth originates from a pre-existing cell by cell division. And so this container that was used in this work existed, uh, was created by a pre-existing cell by cell division, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, genome got taken out and new, new genome got placed inside, right? But you could now ask yourself, okay, what, I, what if I take this genome Can I also boot it inside of a inside of a lipid vesicle, right? Mm -hmm. And this, yeah, this is this is active type of research. Yeah, you realize, okay, hmm, the cell has many many components that help us boot this genome. Uh, it's not so easy to do this inside of a lipid vesicle. So so far, this hasn't been successful, but it's mm -hmm. also a potential route towards, uh, yeah, towards making life from the non-living, making a first mm -hmm. version of a synthetic cell. And as I say, I'm not sure which one of these different routes that exist will be the first one to make it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, when you spoke at the beginning about making RNA structures, let's say yeah. cha channels, so, yeah. so uh, the eyes and mouth, I guess, of the cell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can imagine a situation where you take a living cell, something very basic, and then you create an RNA channel. Yeah. And you put and and then through replication that channel because the RNA maybe you can make out of RNA which yeah. replicates you could potentially generate um a new form of life which just is 
something plus your channel. A right? cyborg cell, so to say. A yeah. cell which functionality you enhance by synthetic components. H have you done anything along these yeah, lines? So or has again, the beauty of RNA origami is that we can genetically encode it inside of a living cell. So we can put mm. a gene which will produce our RNA origami into a cell. And this has been done. And of course, now that we are actually thinking about not just making shapes, but actually functional components for synthetic cells, this is exactly what I mean is when we are talking to biologists, they are super interested in this, right? You can now, you can now equip existing cells with new functionality like a synthetic RNA origami ion channel that you express, that you produce inside of a living cell and thereby give it new function or probe its own function. And in the same way, we can already do this with the DNA origami structures that we have, right? We can add them to cells. So in that case, we don't genetically encode them. We just apply them from the outside. So in a way, it's quite simple. You literally take your dish of cells. Yeah, You literally take it. You take a pipette that contains the DNA origami. You add it in. And like this, we can actually modify living cells. So we can, for instance, modify in the first instance their membranes. So we could, and we have done this, we can link separate cells. And with this, we can address biological questions. So one question we had, we were asking ourselves is, how does the adhesion strength between two cells affect cell migration, mm -hmm. right? And now you could think, okay, how do cells adhere? Well, they have certain proteins, adhesion proteins that make them adhere, like the e cutterins is the name of the protein that makes cells adhere to one another. Um, so, but the, these ecaterins have a certain strength that evolved that is the result of evolution again, right? Um, and now, how do we change this strength? Well, we could engineer the proteins, but this is super hard on a continuous scale. Or we can just replace the link with a DNA duplex. And for a DNA duplex, you can control the adhesion strength by the DNA sequence. So it's actually quite easy to, uh, to have a continuous scale of different adhesion strength. And then you can ask yourself, okay, how does adhesion strength impact cell migration? Or how does adhesion strength impact immune activation? Also, immune cells need to bind to one another. And this is exactly the link to immunology that I meant. So the DNA linkers, the DNA nanostructures that we engineer, we already apply them to address questions in cell biology by making cyborg cells. So by equipping cells with the kind of non-native um, functional structures that we have out there. And as I said, with RNA origami, we can give this a whole new dimension because we can also genetically encode it, which has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it's much more. It, it's funny, you mentioned, so I know that a lot of drugs today target channels, right? Yeah. Um, I, 95, I, I, 90 I think is was quite a lot indeed. Yeah. This is I actually don't understand the biology. So is this because you want the drug to somehow enter the cell and so it needs to go through a channel? Oh, there, is, there's, there's different mechanisms of functions of these kind of drugs that target ion channels. So either they, you know, they are competitive uh, compared to a lid ligand that is natively activating these these kind of chan channels and therefore competing for for um, you know for for bind for a binding site. Um, there's different types of mechanisms. Um, in which these kind of drugs act. But, <laughs> but the reason why I mention it is because you, so rather than designing a drug to match a channel, yeah. this might open a whole new field of medicine and pharmacology sure. where you design the channel for the chemical that you want, right? Yeah. So, so you could have a patient who has some issue, You they receive an injection, which is essentially... I don't know how it worked, but billions of these micro channels that mm -hmm. then burrow into the cell mm -hmm. membrane and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sort of the sky is a limit almost. It's it's like this could, am I being, am I being too extreme in saying this could actually form a whole new you know, branch of pharmacology almost? Well, I mean, if you think about it, most of the drugs that, are, that we use at the moment are, are small molecules, right? And yes, mm. with all of these engineering approaches, we start to get more and more towards systems that are entirely programmable, right? It's opening this whole new field of, of nanomedicine, if you wish. Um, so yes, what you're proposing is, is, is uh, 
is not unthinkable, I would say. I mean, to give you an example uh, of, of, again, the, the immunology type of research that we're doing is you can also ask yourselves, you know, like, can we actually use DNA origami as a, as a vaccine platform, right? Mm -hmm. So can we basically, when we now, when we now vaccinate, uh, we, uh, we vaccinate single antigens, right? Uh, mm -hmm. so, so be it an mRNA vaccine or in other types of vaccines, we are always, we are always taking, say, the spike of the, of the, of the mm -hmm. COVID virus and we are, we are giving that to the, to the patient. But on a virus, these things are, you know, these things are ordered. There's a certain valency, a certain copy number a certain distance of these antigens that are presented on the surface of a virus, right? So in a way, we are doing something very artificial by just putting these things, you know, one by uh, in a monomeric form, so to say. So could we actually design a DNA origami where these kind of uh, these kind of antigens are positioned in a certain spacing in a certain valency? Would this give us a better immune response, especially in cases where you know um, where a long-lasting immune response cannot be obtained at the moment with with uh, traditional vaccination approaches or where it's not sufficient to to, to get a long-lasting immune response like like in malaria or or, or, or hiv or, or others right so and this is again active research that is going on in the dna origami field i guess also you might be able to predict the uh, parameter space in terms of the morphology of yeah. the virus and say okay this is what the spike protein looks like today but maybe in the future it's going to look like this. So I'm going to immunize someone sort of broad spectrum in a sense uh, to hit the full parameter space of how it might evolve. I mean, there are different approaches. You, I don't know if this is crazy, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it, it makes me imagine sort of possibilities in terms of applications. Yeah. So so this is the this is the beauty of it, right? That every DNA slash RNA structure that we engineer as a molecular hardware for a synthetic mm. cell completely blue skies, we find colleagues who are asking exactly these kind of questions and we just need to go to our fridge or freezer quite literally. Oftentimes we have the things lying around. We need to add maybe a modification here and there or they are just happy with what we have and they add it to the cells and they, you know, take the long shot and they try these things, right? And so it's quite nice to have just molecular hardware lying around that others can directly use to, to address these kind of questions. And yeah. So then let's look in the dis in the far future. Yeah. Uh, you're looking back at your time now as a newly minted professor <laughs> and group leader. What do you think when you're looking back will make you most happy about your time here? And what do you think you'll be most proud of? Mm -hmm. So, okay, being there when life was synthesized from the non-living <laughs> would be a dream right i think it's such a cornerstone in human history and just being able to witness this from from close um would would be amazing right but there is more to the science and that's that's of course the people right and and having mentored people through their phds and um you know gone the journey together with them and actually having people who say hey i had a good time in science and i had a good time doing research um is certainly a large aspect of what would make me personally personally happy, right? I had the best time of my life in my PhD in the group of in the group of Ulrich Kaiser, and I've had very very good mentors along the way, and I I just want to be the same for my group and and to you know create an academic research environment as we all want to have it. So you know, uh, just witnessing how. Somebody who is holding a pipette for the first time of their life um, starts out in the lab and then produces amazing research data, uh, writes papers, um, becomes a scientist themselves. Like being witnessing this journey of, of students is, is really just amazing. I mean, Kevin Janke is one example who he was the first PhD student in the group who went out to, to do a postdoc in Harvard. And, you know, I'm sure he will continue doing great types of research and maybe also come back and to see how, how people develop and to be able to recruit 
people to your own group, people you like to work with. And this, by the way, I really want to make clear before we end this podcast, so I do it now. I really want to thank them because they have done, like, they have brought me to where I'm now people ask me like you're super young how can you be a professor and I tell them well because I have the most amazing group you can imagine right and this is really really true um so I shouldn't we shouldn't be ending this podcast without saying really a big big word a word of thank you to to them and also to the to the colleagues that are here around right like yeah you may you may have this genius image in in your mind of a scientist a single uh, lonely scientist doing these kind of things that's not at all how it is right maybe maybe we are a bit of facilitators or so but in the end um in the end it comes down to the, to the people around you that that enable you to do this amazing type of work that that uh, you can do well Kassen Gupfrisch if I pronounce your name I'm gonna get it wrong every time <laughs> I, well Kassen it's been an absolute pleasure thanks for coming on the podcast thank you very much <laughs>